Good evening to everyone. Uh, at the outset, thank you, Dr. Bansi Sabu, for giving me this rare opportunity uh, of being virtually talking to in this conference because normally I attend it uh, physically. Unfortunately, due to circumstances, I will be missing the fund tomorrow. Uh, uh, we had a wonderful talk by Dr. Avinda. So from one trio to the other trio, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, what is the link? We all know the relationship between diabetes and cardiovascular disease, but where does NAFLD fit in? Now, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is defined as excessive hepatic fat accumulation with insulin resistance. And there is steatosis in more than 5% of the hepatocytes, either according to histological analysis or proton density fat fraction of more than 5.6% by proton MRS or quantitative fat water selective MRI. And we must exclude secondary causes and especially alcoholic fatty liver disease, which has been defined as daily alcohol consumption of more than 30 grams for men and more than 20 grams for women. Now, it has been divided into non-alcoholic fatty liver, which is nothing but pure steatosis, steatosis and mild lobular inflammation. And that leads to uh, steatohepatitis, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which can be classified according to the FIP4 calculator scoring from early fibrosis, that is F0, F1, fibrotic, more than F2 to more than F3, and cirrhotic F4, and ultimately can lead to hepatocellular carcinoma. We must remember that the definitive diagnosis of NASH requires a liver biopsy. It affects more than 25 to 30% of the adults worldwide, is typically silent until advanced, and ultimately potentially irreversible liver impairment develops. Normally, we see patients who go on routine ultrasound coming to us with a fatty liver. Earlier, we used to ignore it, but today we are more learned associated with insulin resistance with or without diabetes, obesity, especially visceral adiposity, metabolic syndrome, and dyslipidemia. The various genetic factors, both monogenic and polygenic, which can modulate the risk of development of NAFLD and progress to steatohepatitis. The liver enzymes, AST and ALT, are not useful for the diagnosis because of poor sensitivity and specificity they can be normal even in patients with steatohepatitis. Liver biopsy is the gold standard, but may not be available everywhere, is expensive and may cause various complications. One of the best modalities is vibration control transient elastography, which is a fibro scan. And this gives us an assessment of hepatic elasticity and steatosis and useful for disease staging and longitudinal mo monitoring but usually underused. Most patients with hepatic steatosis do not progress to develop NASH cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma, but some undoubtedly will. If you look at the mortality, cause of death in patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, almost 12% is, is cardiovascular disease. Now, multiple organs are likely to be involved in NAFD, whether it is the adipose tissue, the liver, hepatocytes, or the gut, or the pancreas. And that is why, because of the multifocal involvement of the various organizations, this is now been termed as metabolic associated fatty liver disease. And this has been proposed by a panel of international experts from 22 countries. This new definition, metabolic associated fatty liver disease, basically emphasizes the bidirectional relationship and increases awareness in looking for fatty liver disease among patients with type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease or its risk factors, as well as looking for those diseases among patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So it is a progressive metabolic liver disease, and you can see it is linked to insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, obesity, and basically there is dysregulated metabolism. The the purpose of showing this slide is to give us the impression that the patient should be treated holistically. That is the message, very important message that should go. Now, the common related 
metabolic disorders, of, as I said earlier, is insulin resistance in the not only in the liver, but also in the adipose tissue and muscles, muscle tissue. The metabolic syndrome, which may consist of either impaired fasting glucose or type 2, hypertriglyceridemia, then uh, low HDLC, increased weight circumference, high blood pressure, all these components correlate with liver fat content. And one should evaluate the risk of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in all patients with metabolic syndrome. And conversely, evaluate metabolic syndrome in all patients coming to us with an ultrasound diagnosis of a fatty liver. Irrespective of liver enzymes, diabetes risk and type 2 diabetes are closely associated with the severity of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, progression to state of hepatitis, presence of advanced fibrosis, and development of hepatocellular carcinoma. In individuals with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, screening for diabetes is mandatory, either by fasting or random blood glucose or A1C, or if available, the standardized 75 gram OGTT in high dose groups. We must look for NAFD patients with type 2, irrespective of liver enzyme levels, due to the high risk of disease progression. Now, overall prevalence of NAFD among patients with type 2 diabetes is almost 55.5%, and NASH is, is almost 38%. And 17% of the type 2 diabetes patients who underwent liver biopsy had advanced fibrosis. NAFLD itself increases the risk of type 2 diabetes incidence and the risk of new onset type 2 diabetes is doubled in patients with NAFLD. Moreover, 25% of the patients with fatty liver also have type 2 diabetes. So there is a very strong relationship between fatty liver and type 2 diabetes, which is a complex bidirectional relationship. Indeed, the, the coexistence of these two conditions pejoratively affects the course and prognosis of both the diseases. And type 2 diabetes is associated with higher risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. The basic pathogenesis remains same, lifestyle and genes. The Western diet lifestyle has been associated with weight gain and obesity and fatty liver. So high calorie intake, excessive saturated fat, high fructose intake, sedentary behavior, etc. So the recommendations of the EACL and EASD are unhealthy lifestyle play a role in the development and progression of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So it is very important to assess both dietary and physical acti uh, uh, activity habits as part of a comprehensive screening. Now, what is the relationship with fatty liver and cardiovascular disease? There is a strong relation and, and, and looking at the four surrogate markers like carotid artery, intima media thickness or plaques, arterial stiffness, coronary artery calcification and endothelial dysfunction, a meta-analysis performed by Zhao showed that there is a lot of subclinical atherosclerosis. So in the systemic review and meta-analysis, which included 26 observational studies almost more than 85,000 patients, which had almost 30,000 fatty liver disease cases. They exhibited a significant independent association with subclinical atherosclerosis compared with the non, almost 60% more. Another meta-analysis by Target et al. based on 16 observational studies, including almost 34,000 patients, median follow-up of 6.9 years, confirmed the strong association between fatty liver biopsy proven and incidence of cardiovascular events. The fatal and non-fatal CVD events were 64% more. Another study by et al. have recently reported an increase in the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease related deaths in the USA based on data from the National Vital Statistics System between 2007 and 2016. Interestingly, cardiovascular disease was the second leading cause of specific death. And the shared common pathophysiological pathways include low-grade inflammation, oxidative stress, and insulin resistance. If you look at the natural history and complications, prevalence of cardiovascular disease is higher in fatty liver than in mass controls, and CVD should be identified regardless of traditional risk factors. Both CVD and metabolic risk factors are also reported 
in adolescents and children with a fatty liver. So the recommendation is that it is mandatory to screen all patients of any FLD for cardiovascular complications and they should be screened. Now, when you look at the three together, type 2 diabetes has long been recognized as an independent cardiovascular risk factor and is a frequent finding in fatty liver disease. 60% of the patients with type 2 diabetes have a fatty liver disease. And this is increasingly common, underdiagnosed, and underappreciated independent risk factor for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. In fact, it has been said that the presence of NALPD is a basically a risk enhancer. Now, given the strong association with the fatty liver and type 2, assessing the independent cardiovascular effect of these two conditions remains a bit challenging. However, patients with type 2 and a fatty liver exhibit higher risk of cardiovascular disease compared to those diabetic patients without fatty liver, suggesting a potential synergistic increase of cardiovascular risk in patients with both type 2 diabetes and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, as I showed you the various shared pathophysiological pathways. In fact, the CVD is one of the leading causes, as I earlier mentioned, in a fatty liver. And we have now several anti-diabetic therapies which have shown beneficial effects in both fatty liver and cardiovascular disease. There was a, another study, cohort study from Diabetes Registry in Scotland in more than 134,000 patients. And there it was shown that NAF, FLD were independently associated with increased risk of CVD events and mortality of, over a period of almost 4.5 years. And this was further confirmed by meta analysis 11 studies in around 8,000, more than 8,000 patients where almost 4,000 were NAFLD diagnosed by abdominal ultrasound. Now, analysis of the pool effects showed that there was a do double the risk of cardiovascular disease in patients with diabetes, but without NFLD uh, compared to them. This suggests that there is an additional effect of fatty liver disease in patients with type 2 in the long-term risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, what are the potential pathophysiological mechanisms? The classical proatherogenic lipid alteration. We all know about the diabetic dyslipidemia, elevated triglyceride, low SDL, increased small dense LDL. There is a fat accumulation in the liver, insulin resistance, and there is increased production of VLDL and increase in the CETP or uh, cholesterol ester trans protein activity. And this leads to increased triacylglycerol in the SDL and LDL, and hence small and dense LDL. Then there are various thrombosis factors like the PI1 levels, which are mainly determined by the liver. And we also know that type 2 diabetes per se is a prothrombotic condition due to increased platelet reactivity, higher levels of coagulant agents, and lower concentrations of endogenous anticoagulants. Insulin resistance, especially in the liver, and hyperglycemia per se can influence coronary artery disease through a direct effect on the structure of the arterial wall by the promotion of monocyte macrophage addition to the endothelium, enhancement of vascular smooth muscle cell proliferation and induction of endothelial dysfunction and inflammatory macrophages. Then there is low-grade inflammation because of endoplasmic reticulum stress. It has recently been seen that there is a microbiome alteration, obesity, Type 2 diabetes and fatty liver share common gut micro, microbiome alteration, such as a decrease in the abundance of lactobacillus and increased abundance of rosburia and E. coli. And this is this biosis is also associated with cardiovascular disease. And there are very potential important factors like the trimethylamine anoxide and short chain fatty acids and that polysaccharides that take come to. Just to summarize the, the uh, pathogenesis, we have uh, seen this increase in the VLDL, increase in the small dense LDL, increased ACTP activity. I talked about the thrombosis factors, increase in PA1, platelet reactivity, proglobulin agents, and decrease in endogenous anticoagulants, low grade inflammation, hyperglycemia per se, increased cytokines, interleukin 1, 6, and tumor necrosis factor alpha, increased CRP, fibrin, then A mitochondrial dysfunction, oxidative stress, and microbone alteration. Now, as far as the management is concerned, diet and lifestyle changes 
play a very, very important role and modest weight loss reduces liver fat, improves hepatic insulin resistance and can result in the regression of a fatty liver. Weight loss of more than 7% has shown histological improvement. Now, structured programs aimed at lifestyle changes towards healthy diet and habitual physical activity are advisable. They should receive counseling for a healthy diet, physical activity, but no pharmacotherapy as such. In overweight, obese patients, the target should be a weight loss of around 7 to 10 percent. Dietary restriction plus a progressive increase in aerobic exercise resistance training, which is tailored approach. And these are basically based on energy restriction and exclusion of processed food and beverages high in added fructose. Now, both aerobic exercise and resistance training effectively reduce liver fat. So the comprehensive lifestyle, the energy restriction, the decrease in the fructose import, uh, intake, uh, avoiding abuse of alcohol, coffee consumption has no problem, looking at the macronutrient composition and a physical activity. And then we have a lot of emerging therapies that can lower the activity of liver enzymes, fibrosis and inflammation, such as the pioglitazone, SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1-RA and saroglitazone, as well as modification in gut micro microbiome. And as the next speaker will talk on the statin of this century, SGLT2 inhibitors have a role not only in the suppressed type 2 diabetes, the suppressed cardiovascular disease, and the suppressed kidney disease, but they have also shown histological improvement in the liver. And, uh, and with the present data, we know that the uh, dual inhibitors, SGLT1 and 2 inhibitors, sotaglitosin, is likely as effective as SGLT2 inhibitors as far as the cardiorenal benefits are concerned. But they have an added benefit of reducing non-fatal and fatal stroke, as well as non-fatal and fatal MI by more than 30 persons. So if available and when available, I think they would be a preferred choice. So to wrap up, metabolic associated fatty liver disease is the new clinical definition for fatty liver disease, which shifts from a disease of exclusion to one of inclusion, where the pathogenic processes originate from underlying metabolic dysfunction. There is a strong evidence of association between fatty liver disease and increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And given the strong association between CVD, type 2 diabetes and fatty liver, it is very important that the assessment of individual impacts of these two diseases on cardiovascular disease is in fact very challenging. And studies performed in patients with type 2 diabetes have shown that the coexistence of both diseases tends to increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. However, there are several common pathophysiological pathways which I discussed, and patients with both type 2 diabetes and fatty liver should be considered at high risk for cardiovascular disease, and they require a very aggressive, intensive cardiovascular prevention approach. Furthermore, as I talked about the current drugs, the SCLT2 inhibitors, ELP1, RS, they have shown beneficial effects in both of these conditions, and it is important that they should be used in the individualized management of patients with type 2 diabetes. Finally, studies with long-term follow-up are needed to demonstrate that the treatment of fatty liver disease reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease. Thank you for a patient hearing.